Welcome to the Triple Point Podcast, a podcast for those working at the intersection of weather and climate, technology, and society. We focus on innovators and leaders working to make our communities safe and resilient in the face of a dynamic and ever-changing world. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff Cunningham. And I am Ryan Harris. And wow, do we have an incredible discussion lined up this week. Hurricanes, COVID, among other things, thwarted our plans the past several weeks. But we finally got a chance to have Arvin from TerraWatch Space on the show for a unique collaborative podcast. Arvin is a pioneering thought leader in the Earth observation space and hosts his own show, newsletter, and consulting business. In his most recent newsletter, he shares some illuminating insights on the weather operating tech stack. Jeff and I definitely encourage you to visit his site and sign up for his newsletter. Buckle up for the next hour, though, as Aravind joins us to take you on a thought-provoking journey through the Earth observation technology space. All systems go for launch. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the show, Aravind. We finally, after two or three months of trying to coordinate this, it's, it's good to have you on, brother. Hey, thanks for having me on, Brian. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, um, you know, I know, I know you're from India originally. You're living in, in France, and you, you really dove headfirst in the Earth observation space. So for our listeners, tell us a little bit about yourself right, in your journey. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Arvind. I come from India. Uh, I started my career in, in software. Yeah, that was what, 12 years ago. I used to work at Amazon and then I got bored of software engineering and I wanted to live abroad. So I moved to Europe, moved on to the business side of things and worked at a startup in business development and sales. And yeah, I got bored of that again <laughs> a couple of years after. Uh, and, I, and I thought it was pretty boring and, you know, we've reached uh, some saturation level and I wanted to get something closer to something that is more impactful. And I was not really a huge space geek or anything, but I was just looking for a space to work on, no pun intended, that is, you know, that's going to make the impact or have an impact, but it's also, you know, challenging, interesting, uh, et cetera. And that space kind of fit the bill, but it was almost an accident because I met someone who was, you know, doing a PhD in something related to, I guess, exoplanets and I was reading a book about interstellar. Of course, I was interested in science and space and all that. And I was reading a book called The Science of Interstellar after watching Interstellar. And and we just got started to chat. And, and yeah, and that's kind of how I sparked. Uh, I mean, the, the interest really got started. And I got into space in 2016. And obviously, you know, given my background, obviously, I could have continued in software. But, you know, I'd already left the tech side of things. So uh, the, from the business side, the only thing I could do was consulting. So... That's how I got started in the space industry. I joined uh, PwC, the consulting company, and they had a space practice here in France, a small, pretty small team, but you know, that predominantly works only on space related consulting assignments. And the first mission that I worked on there was an Earth observation project, which kind of introduced me to, yeah, all things Earth observation, because it was a, an assignment for the European Space Agency on the impacts of the Earth Observation Program in Europe. It's almost like, a, you know, every three years there's a ministerial in Europe and you prepare a report on, you know, how good the last three years were in terms of benefits, what were the impacts, uh, you know, what's the plan going forward, things like that. So that was the first project I worked on. So, you know, my <laughs> my entry into Earth Observation was accidental. And then, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. And yeah, I was there for a few years uh, working on a lot of assignments for ESA, um, space agencies around the world companies around the world on go-to-market strategy, uh, et cetera, and due diligence. And I left in 2020, kind of started doing my own thing, focusing on Earth observation. Uh, and that's kind of when I started doing the podcast and the blog and, and yeah, did a bunch of work. And that eventually led me to Tomorrow IO, which is a, you know, weather a software company that was, you know, that had just announced that it was going to launch satellites. And it was, it was a framework that I was very interested in and I wrote about it you know, two years before tomorrow started about how to build a unicorn company in Earth Observation. And uh, it started with, you know, start with the problem, uh, you know, don't launch satellites from the get go, you know, have a problem in mind, see if it's really needed. And it seems like that was the exact thing that tomorrow I did uh, in their in their endeavor to kind of launch satellites and, you know, make forecasts better. So yeah, so that interested me and I got into tomorrow and, you know, over a year and a half, learned a lot about the weather world and 
and I was also leading on the commercial and the go-to-market side of things. That's kind of what I was doing there. Um, and a year and a year after that, I left to go full time on Terror Watch, which is now a two-part business. The first part, which is which is the majority of the business, is the consulting part, the advisory bit. So working with space agencies, working with Earth Observation and space companies, uh, working with uh, investors, and also working with end users on adoption strategies of you know what technology space has to offer and how they can adopt it. And the second part is the communication side of things, which is the blog and the writing and the podcast and all that. So yeah, so that's kind of what I'm up to now. It's great. And, you know, when when we were thinking about uh, different shows that, uh, you know, Jeff and I wanted to have for the Triple Point, you know, one of them was really the show that we're doing right now here is, is a show focused on Earth observation technology. And, and so what I, I mean, we see this show or this episode less of a interview and, and more of a collaboration. And, and so it's, it's great to have someone like yourself uh, with a varied background um, and, you know, our first guest overseas, you know, you're, you're sitting over in Toulouse, right? In France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in France. Yeah, I've, I've lived in different parts of Europe, but Toulouse is kind of where I am today. Got you. So are, are, you, are you a football guy or a cricket guy being from India? Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's a bit of both. Uh, it was more cricket and less football when I was in India and I moved to Europe eight years ago. So it's been more football and less cricket uh, or soccer. So, so I, I, I'm guessing you're going for France coming up here uh, with the... Yeah, it's not, it's, not my, it's not my partner would not be happy. She's French um, and her family would just, you know... I don't know, send me back to India if I don't support France and the seven pounds coming up. I don't know when the episode's going up, uh, going out. But yeah, I think uh, back-to-back World Cups, it's never happened. So it's uh, it's going to be great if, if they can do it. It's also a great team. Yeah, I think they've they've got the strongest team, I think. We'll see. We'll see if uh, Messi has anything to say we'll, if they get to the final two. So. That'll be great, too. Well, one of the, uh, one of the questions um, before we dive really headfirst into the EO space is, Things seem like they're going pretty well with TerraWatch in terms of, you know, consulting and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think you've got a successful blog and newsletter and podcast going. I think you shared a really insightful one here recently in the last month on on weather in the EOS space and how untapped uh, the space is. And it, and it really is. Um, there's just so many different applications. And I'm, I'm sure you saw a sliver of that when you were at Tomorrow.io and, and beyond in that piece though I, I really appreciated your a little bit of your story up front of you know why the interest why the weather part interested you with your experience with tropical cyclones in india can you share with us a little bit about about you know that and, and maybe we can start to get into you know a little bit of your thesis of that uh that weather newsletter sure yeah and obviously you know everyone has a story with weather you know it's I always say, I always thought uh, I've had every, and, you know, if you listen to the Weather Geeks podcast, uh, which is a pretty popular one in the in the meteorological world, um, and the first question is how everyone got interested in weather, and everyone has a story because, you know, that's it's that type of topic that everyone has something to say or a unique story. Um, but in my case, obviously, you know, I grew up in the south of India in a city called Chennai, um, which is, you know, near the, near the sea. So obviously we were hit by cyclones and storms every other year the intensity and the frequency of which has you know increased over time which you know which is kind of which is true for from a global perspective but you know this is anecdotal but yeah no obviously i've had my fair share of experiences growing up you know in in a flooded house you know living over a week uh, in a house with with water because you know obviously uh, i think it's a function of you know where we were living but also it's a function of you know how soon the weather alerts and warnings were generated i think it's gotten better in the last 10 15 years but but yeah i mean i didn't i didn't really think about that uh you know when we were going through that and you know in 2015 or was it 2014 and 15 was the year that was just just crazy because you know there was a huge cyclone that kind of i think we the city got rainfall of the entire year in a day and i don't think the city was prepared for that uh so you know obviously i couldn't reach out reach my family or friends or anything for a few days and you know it was it was pretty freaky and i guess uh you know if you're in florida it's probably you know tuesday for you <laughs> in terms of uh you know having these experiences but then um but then you know when when i got into the industry and started learning the science behind it and let's say the the things that happen in the background it was just very very interesting of you know why the way things are they are 
uh, and you know, the more I got into understanding the technology and the, let's say, the politics and also the gaps, uh, you start to appreciate why you know the, the the number of casualties mostly tend to be in single digits, majority of cases in the West, but in three or four digits uh, in the other sides of the on the other side of the world. And you know, it's not just a case of just population and having a lot more people. Uh, you know, population density I think has a role to play, but then. It's also a question of you know what the what the system is and you know what yeah well, what the technology behind that is and you know unless you improve that um, you know it's not going to get better it's not magic right so even with higher population density you can still have you know people saved and you have case studies from the west of how you know having these alerts well ahead of time and you know you had that this year in the U.S. Um, you know of course the hurricane Ian had a huge impact on on lives and and property but then you know it did save i would argue you know hundreds and thousands of lives if the warnings were not given you know weeks in advance uh, or even a few days in advance which was not the case uh, not only in india but in a number of developing countries so therefore you know the three three digit casualties and you know what we saw in pakistan uh, this year it's not it's not really surprising that you know the 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 technology doesn't exist, but also more importantly, the last mile delivery also doesn't exist, right? Like just because you have the best weather forecast doesn't mean that people are going to reach it or people are going to believe what they're going to see and who's giving out that message. So it's it's pretty complex, and I think uh, the experience of tomorrow and also you know talking to experts and you know the community that we have made me appreciate the whole entire value chain. And I I, I have a, had a graphic on the on the blog that I wrote of the multidisciplinary science behind weather and you know people just assume and you know the thing to appreciate is just because you have a satellite launched doesn't mean that people's lives are going to be saved you know it's also a question of does that data have an impact on the model and after the model spits out a forecast does that forecast reaches people the right way and you know once that reach, reaches people is that being communicated the right way right so yeah there's a, such a whole complex ecosystem so, you know, Earth Observation is just, you know, the first part, the satellites are just the first part. So it was a, it was a great kind of a learning. And that's kind of why I wrote the blog was because I, I figured that a lot of people just assumed that it was either a solved problem and it usually doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, despite the almost daily kind of news that we hear and just made me a little angry as well, like, how is that OK? And we moved on to other things, but we've still not solved this. right? So. It, it was it was also kind of um yeah kind of defeating the purpose of you know how we are not really building global globally applicable technology or you know globally impactful technology yeah th- those are some uh very uh, interesting insights one of the well you said several things that triggered like 15 questions for me but ryan <laughs> starts yelling at me if i ask all of them so yeah but you know um, we're here to talk about it yeah, so <laughs> let's let's so- talk so the the first thing I'm going to say something very unscientific, but I think there's some truth to it. One of the things that in the U.S. in particular, there are two phenomena, two phenomena that happened in in, in at least Ryan and I's lifetime, and you know, in the last couple of decades. One is the Weather Channel and the movie Twister. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's a lot of public popular media in the U.S. on on weather, and I. I can't help but wonder how much, I mean, I know it's influenced a lot of people to enter the meteorology or the atmospheric sciences career field. And, and, you know, maybe for all the wrong reasons, right? Because it was this, you know, exciting movie twister or when I was a kid, uh, you know, I, I don't remember a lot of hurricanes in, in Florida other than Andrew, because I think in that, that deck, that decade or two that I grew up, there weren't a lot of like really impactful hurricanes besides Andrew. It was a very slow period. Um, but I do remember the weather channel and I do remember, you know, watching it, you know, constantly, my dad would always have it on. And when the March 93 storm came through the super storm that dumped a bu- bunch of snow on Ryan, you were in North Georgia, Ryan? Yeah. North Georgia. Yeah. North Georgia. Well, it's, it's, um, it's burned off a, a bunch of tornadoes in Florida, right? I mean, just, there was a, squall line and all of that was covered on the weather channel and the radar, you know? And so, uh, I, anyway, I, I know that has, there's always been at least for the last couple of decades, you know, this kind of like media social interest in, in weather and at least in the United States that I've, that I've seen. And so 
I'm, I'm wondering how much that plays into, you know, the involvement of, you know, that, that full value chain of information. Right. I mean, so in, in the U S we have the, you know, we have the government services that traditionally have provided a lot of the satellite stuff. We have the weather service, uh, but then all of the media companies have been involved with delivering some of that information. I just, I haven't spent enough time overseas and received weather forecasts to know, you know, how that is, how, how, how is that, that media component, if you will, in, uh, in other parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, it, it does exist, uh, but I think it's predominantly the, during the, you know, the news bulletins on, on TV, well, both in India and also in, in, in Europe, from what I've seen, and of course, you know, in today's world, the, the app economy has taken over and everybody just has that on their, on their smartphone. And, you know, you just pull up the app and, and, and I think um, when I had uh, Dr. Mar Marsha Shepard on, on the podcast, who was the, um, who was the previous uh, president of AMS, and, you know, he's a professor in the University of Georgia, and, you know, he's done a bunch of stuff. And he, he was almost, you know, dismissive of how everything has been reduced to an icon. I mean, it's great that we were able to do that, but then it's also wrong that we did that because, you know, it's just going to show thunderstorms icon. You know, people don't know if, if they can walk out and you know be struck by lightning or anything right so it doesn't say that i mean it does convey that in text and you need to go through and read this weirdly <laughs> with, with a weird user experience right like they haven't figured that that out they have uh, figured out the icon bit but yeah he said that and um and i think that's true for a lot of the world the you know the the apps have made it easier to provide the updates but I guess they don't come convey the complexity. And I think people don't appreciate the complexity. Maybe in, you know, I don't know how they convey that in media of, you know, if there is if there's the chance of a very heavy thunderstorm and, you know, they say it's a 30%. I don't know if they convey what that 30% means, you know, because people just assume 30% is low. So they just go about doing their business. But then, you know, when the when when they're struck by the showers or these heavy thunderstorms, they're just surprised. But then, you know, 30% actually means that there is a 30% of, you know, the area in that in that forecast where it is possible to have the thunderstorm. So, you know, it was the right forecast, but it was not conveyed correctly, right? So this, this kind of complex communication, maybe you can kind of circumvent that if you have a media channel taking over and telling the story properly. But then if you have the app, I don't know if that does justice. Um, and, you know, to your point about how is it in the different parts of the world, they are kind of... I don't know if the the media business is kind of taking over as much as it is in the in the US. In the US, I know that all top uh, channels have you know Fox even has a weather channel now, right? Like they've they've spun off a Fox weather channel as as a, as a separate channel, which is which is crazy. But you know, I don't think it can happen. I've seen that happen in other parts of the world. Uh, I've seen like longer bulletins of of um, I'm, I'm saying meteo in in French in uh, in France. Uh, but, but yeah, no, not to the level of the US. I think that it would be useful to be honest, to have that, uh, because as the technology improves and the forecast improves, we need to update the communication. Uh, I don't think it's just a question of, you know, the developing countries either improving their capabilities, but they are not you know, kind of investing on the, on the communication side, which is essentially a media side. So I hope that improves as well, because, you know, it's it's not great to read ten lines of text to understand and 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 what's surprising for me is you know that's how today's launches are getting the weather forecasts. I don't know if you've seen like the Space Force or yes, yeah, usually the Space Force that puts out the you know the percentage chance of a launch happening. It is actually a one page document that I have to go through to actually read. Okay, there is a forty percent chance that there'll be wins, and I'm like, can't we make that better? Because it's 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 been it's been crazy. But yeah, that's that's been one of the one of the questions that I had at tomorrow, because tomorrow has like a beautiful interface where you can see. And, but even now the space for space force puts out, you know, a one pager that that's full of text. Ryan and I might know a guy <laughs> that, that runs that place. We know, we know a couple of guys that run that place. <laughs> uh, well, not the NASA part, but the air force part yeah, down at, Spa part. at uh, Cape Canaveral. Yeah. I'm just surprised that, you know, can, can, do they have plans to kind of make that, I don't know, more, understandable for you know because i've i've had like people like ask me like oh is that launch going to happen and i'm like oh maybe it's going to be you know there's it depends on weather and and they want to ask you know they they kind of planning a launch party or a viewing party or whatever and they're like hey, what's the chance it's going to happen i want them to be you know redirected to a link 
where they can just like view instead of sending this one pager. But this is the only thing that I can send them. <laughs> we are not all experts to understand, oh, there's a 40% of chance that the winds are going to come uh, from the Northeast. So that can have an impact. Those are all something that I have to assume and know before I can understand that forecast. But yeah, anyway, that's just uh, one thing that just surprised me. Anyway, I haven't been directly involved with Space Launch, although I've help produce the models that produce the forecast that produce the, um, the forecast. And I, and I have some understanding of how they do it, but there, it used to be a, particularly with the shuttle launches that there was a fairly complex set of rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is, you know, 90, for, 97, there's 97. I think I, I'm just, I, it's right around 97 criteria that are weather related. And they haven't, and they haven't created a good software tool to kind of automate that. It's pretty sophisticated, and, yeah. and it's and it and they're not showing you everything that they've got behind the oh, the curtain. Got it, okay. for sure too. So, so for instance, in the shuttle, and I can't speak to any of the current rocket launches, but in the shuttle era, I mean, there was a forecast for all of the recovery locations. There was a forecast for, mm-hmm. you know, um, various obviously altitudes. There was a space weather element. There was a, you know, so there's it was a very complex go no go, you know, and even though it was you know. Uh, managed to go down to a binary answer it was yeah. often all of these you know complex um, things in there yeah well on on the on the launch bit right like we have to be talking about like oh people are scanning for scouting for locations around the world to launch from uh, you know there's talks about brazil there are talks about you know africa the talks about southeast asia there are you know obviously all the you know equatorial locations and i'm like do the folks who are planning, especially the launch and spaceport companies, know how the forecast situation is? Do you just assume you'll get the level of detail that you get in the in, in Cape Canaveral or in Vandenberg over there? Because it seems well, like it, they're going to go there, set up the spaceport, and then they're going to figure out, ah, okay, so we won't get the hyperlocal forecast that we get in Cape Canaveral here. And, you know, so it's going to be like a reactive or, understanding. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm in Southeast Asia and I'm I'm setting it up in a place that gets thunderstorms for two thirds of the year. Well, so so when I was a, a long time ago, I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy and, and I did my summer research down at, at the Cape and um, they got to, I, I got to sit for like a, a week or two, you know, monitoring all of their lightning awareness equipment. They had, I can't remember the names of everything, but they had field mills, which could tell you the in real time electric field across the whole uh, de- uh range right. uh, and and then um there was a, a capability called eldar where you could you know, practically see four dimensional four dimensional yeah, lightning four dimensional lightning you basically see the leader building up before the strike which is really wicked um and so you i did my master's thesis with that yeah. data <laughs> so and then my uh my my summer research project was taking their mesonet which was very dense, both horizontally and vertically. Uh, and I could, I had to plot, it was basically wind fields to map all of the microbursts as they progressed across the, the, uh, the range. So the, like the, the millions and probably billions at this point of dollars dumped into, you know, monitoring the weather and the environment around the launch facility, particularly that one it is phenomenal. The observation network around there is just incredible, as Jeff kind of alluded to. And so the the treasure trove of data, so you're a computer scientist by background, right? I mean, so the, the things that start popping into your head should be like, what can we do with machine learning to train some of this stuff or, you know, or artificial intelligence? Because yep. it's it's too much. It's too much, you know, static. You got to you got to find the signal in, the, in that noise. Um, and so you know, when we look at like earth observation technology, I mean, that's, that's another area where you've got a global or at least regional swaths, you know, if you're talking about polar orbiters of data that we're just throwing on the floor right now, a lot in a lot of cases. And especially when you talk about like hyperspectral, I guess the beauty of that is a beauty of technology right now is more and more companies are as, as they either launch their own satellites or they take advantage of other satellite data, they're starting to be able to come up with these, you know, sophisticated, highly sophisticated machine learning techniques, artificial intelligence techniques to take advantage of all that data, you know, um, whether it's, it's for a launch forecast at Cape Canaveral or it's an agriculture 
um, prediction or whatever the case is. That's and that's that's the beauty of of satellites. And and I think you know I think Jeff as a modeler would would agree with this. Like we didn't see a significant bump in uh, weather prediction or weather accuracy until the the satellite era when we started to actually put those SDRs, those satellite data records into, or the satellite data actually into the numerical weather modeling. And it seems like we're, we're constantly trying to figure out how to put more and more data, whether that's, you know, unique ways of slicing the atmosphere radio optically, you know, through radio occultation data that Spire is doing or um, hyperspectral, how can we put some of the, the, the higher spectral resolution data? So, I mean, like, the, the volume of data seems to me in this Earth observation space to be both a benefit and a significant challenge. Would you, mm -hmm. would you agree? Yeah, no, 100%. I think the, the challenge is, I don't know if that's been documented, but then I'd like to see an index of, you know, the, the amount of useful data downlinked. I know we can define useful by whatever it is, but then just based on how much data has been integrated into some kind of models, with weather, it's probably easier to do because it's probably recorded and I think we can find, um, you know, kind of find that index and coefficient in some way. But then with, with the, in the imaging world, it's probably harder because there are so many more companies uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the weather world where, you know, if you have companies like Planet and Maxar and dozens of them coming in, um, imaging the Earth in, in different sensors, whether it's hyperspectral, SAR, or um, or just, you know, visible uh, panchromatic imagery. But yeah, it, it's, it's going to be crazy for the end users. And I don't know if we have made that enough. Uh, sorry, we've made that easier for end users, for them to kind of appreciate the trade-offs that are involved. Because if you want to do crop yield prediction, you can do, you can just use, you know, panchromatic RGB and you can kind of get some insights from that but it's probably not enough but you can then go deeper hyperspectral and you know look into the specific signatures of plants to understand the plant health or I you know identify crops whatever it is um, or you can you know use a combination of this and then an infrared sensor that can give you some sort of you know temperature and water level uh, within the plant so if you're trying to you know, understand everything that's going on. And of course, there's the, there's the, you know, data from weather satellites that can give, kind of give an indication of soil moisture or how things are progressing uh, in, in terms of water table and, you know, how, how, how much rainfall is going to occur over a period of, um, you know, a few days. And, you know, that supports the irrigation. So if you're an end user who are just in this world, you're just like overwhelmed with all that data that you have, because, I gave like four or five examples with four or five different use cases and four or five different kind of satellites, or maybe not four or five different satellites. I gave four or five sensors, which are being, you know, there are dozens of satellites with these sensors. And if you are a data scientist, you just, yeah, you're just confused of how do you actually make the trade off. And, you know, un unfortunately, and all of this is free as well, right? So there's a commercial angle to it. So which one should we buy? Which one? Should, and that's why it's, you know, I work with some companies helping them define the strategy of how they can build this team because they have a use case and it's usually, um, it's usually they, sometimes they don't know what they can do. So it's, it's figuring out what that use case is. And once they've, you know, kind of nailed the use case that is commercially valuable for them, they then go and find out like what technologies in our earth observation world can help match that need. And of course, their, you know, their starting point is can, how much can open data do? How much can data from you know the Copernicus and the Landsat and uh, missions and you know data from NOAA and UMATSAT uh, and other you know meteorological agencies can help fill that gap because that's their go-to uh, or starting point. And then you know they look at commercial missions as gap fillers. So the open versus commercial kind of makes that a tad easier, I would say, because they have a starting point. So, you know, when you're making trade-offs, you're like, okay, I need this and this is possible with open data and this is going to come next year or in two years. So they can kind of plan for that. But yeah, it is it is a big challenge, uh, especially as you enter the commercial world. It is it is very, very challenging because each company has a different pricing model and each company's data quality is not the same, which I don't think is talked about a lot, especially you know, as, as in, the, in the weather world, it gets commercialized and, you know, we're going to have 
RO data. And I think there have been some evaluations that have been done from by NOAA on RO sensors by Spire and Geoptics and all those guys on how the data quality is and how more importantly impactful it is for forecasts. So as, as we do more of these, I think it's, it's going to become more evident, uh, you know, just because we have more data. Well, it's just now almost a hypothesis, right? Like the more you generate data, whatever the type of data it is, the more value is not true. Uh, you know, you need to kind of model that and, you know, produce studies. And the more we do that, I think the more the end users benefits will become clear because if they just see that, you know, buying commercial data is providing a 10% improvement in the forecast and the 10% improvement is actually, you know, not a big loss for their bottom line. Why would they need to go and buy or, you know, they just depend on open data and, you know, get, get done with it. Right. So it is going to be a challenge on how we kind of overcome that. And yeah, I mean, AI is going to play a, play a role, not just in, not just in the processing um, of, of the data, but then taking away the, the boring bits of, you know, that's what AI is very good at, right? Like the pre-processing part, like, removing, uh, you know, making the SNR better when it's in, in the hyperspectral case or, you know, I don't know, cleaning the data, removing clouds or, you know, applying cloud masks, you know, things like that. I think that's where the role of AI, for me, it's more on the pre-processing, more on the processing because the processing is very subjective and use case driven. And so that's going to be incremental, but then the impact of AI is going to be more seen on the re repetitive, boring tasks uh, that we're doing now. So I have a question. Ryan and I talked about this a couple times on the podcast. Um, we we've observed, you know, in our careers, you know, at, at the very outset of our career, government provided meteorological services and mm -hmm. data as being the predominant, you know, source of data, and also controlling almost controlling the entire vertical of the industry and community, right? Like, so it's mm -hmm. all the way from data, launching the satellites, providing ground sensors, you know, doing the for modeling, the forecasting, all the way down to even the basic services of forecast delivery and some risk management. And then, um, you know, and then the, there was a media component in there, but that traditionally mm -hmm. that media component was kind of the predominant, you know, because our first, Ryan and I joke about it, but like the question that we always got when we first where meteorologists is, oh, what channel are you on? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and and so, you know, I'm like, well, I'm not on TV. I'm in the Air Force, but oh, so are you a pilot? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are you a pilot? Anyway, um, and so um, now more recently, he and I have retired. We've, you know, and and while in the Air Force, we got exposed to more commercial companies, mm -hmm. uh, a variety of different companies, and I won't go into those specifics, but. One of the things I've seen with some of those companies, and then since I've been on the outside with other companies, is weather companies, commercial companies often seem to start with like an app or a single offering, but then quickly realize that they have to create a vertical mm -hmm. to like survive. And so I think of, you know, I won't put names to it right this minute, but like companies that create a weather station and then realize, oh, we can network all of this data together and pr produce a data platform and then, you know, deliver an API, you know. And so Ryan and I have a side project where we're, we've collected, yeah, over 200 companies, you know, providing weather services. And we've, we've just taken a look at, okay, what are the, all of their revenue sources that, you mm -hmm. know, find an open source? there's some physical products a lot of times there's a there's a vertical integration up to from the observations to to data platform and then some mm -hmm. some apps for delivery and stuff like that okay so that's a lot of preview to the question i'm going to ask like where do you see all of this going and and how many i mean that's very expensive to vertically integrate like sure. you can't just it's very hard to bootstrap something like that not impossible perhaps but very challenging. And then I just listened to uh, tomorrow.io's um, podcast with how I built this recently. And, and they talked to, they said the exact same thing, which is like, ah, oh, yes, we've, we've got to kind of do this uh -huh. vertical integration. So anyway, I'll pause and want to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously I think the, for me, the, I think I'm in, in my blog, I, I wrote like two or three points that are just absolutely needed uh, in the weather world. Uh, you talked about revenue sources. 
you know, you look at how these companies are, especially in the commercial sector, launching satellites that are trying to make money is obviously starting from the government and, uh, you know, the, the DOD and, you know, looking at supporting them with their data gaps and how they can go about doing things. So I think that's kind of one thing that they will absolutely do because that's kind of where the money is and also the demands are. And the second thing is vertical integration because, you know, the, that's probably been the biggest surprising learning for me. And I don't know why that is the case, because if you look at earth observation in kind of two segments, one is imaging and that's kind of the, the, the land and that's the second is more weather, which is more on the atmosphere side. The land is looking, the, the industry is looking more towards democratization. So, you know, there are a lot of people who can use that data. I'm saying a lot, with, you know, it's a, it's a small asterisk on top, but not a lot of people can work with, uh, you know, geospatial data. But that's that's more looking towards, you know, opening uh, opening it up and then having a lot more people use it. Whereas with, with meteorological data, it's they just consume the products. People are not even interested in, consuming an analysis ready data you know i'm talking about enterprises so if you're an insurance company you're an energy company who absolutely need weather data now more so than ever because you know you're looking through energy transition you want to predict how much wind there's going to be if you're you know uh, you know in that world or if you're an insurance company who wants to understand the risks and build better parametric insurance models they are I don't know why, but they are less likely to consume. It's probably a function of how they're used to, because you, as you said, for a few decades, they're used to getting products that are almost ready to use, that they can just integrate into their product. They can get the temperature data, the humidity, the winds, the, you know, whatever variable, you name it. But yeah, the, in, in today's world, it's it seems like if you're a company, you've got to go all the way because the, the customer, the buying habits, as they're called, is is not going to go you know further than that you know they are not going to set up a modeling team i think we have started to see some of that happen you know it's been traditionally of course the governments which will have modeling teams or the air force or let's say some large corporations who have an absolute business case they have these modeling teams so you know they are capable of consuming you know let's say a product of uh, some sort of a forecast and then improve that uh, with some sort of proprietary data data that they have. But then a lot of customers just expect the insights to be delivered. So, you know, the vertical integration needs to be even further than that. And which is why I think tomorrow's case for me is pretty compelling because a lot of them are just going to feel, I don't know how it's going to go, but then I just feel like because they have, they're providing like insights that are saying, go and de-ice the plane, don't worry about anything. You know, you don't need to set up, a, if you're an airline company, just let us deal with everything. You know, you can set the criteria for, you know, when, you know, your company's case is for de-icing the plane and we'll just send you an alert for when to de-ice the plane, you know, forget the rest. I don't know if that's going to go that way or, you know, if all of those companies are going to go ahead and set up these meteorological teams, in which case, you know, the companies don't have to be vertically integrated, right? Like they can just set up the infrastructure, you know, the sensors, and the companies are going to have the teams that are capable of consuming the data, but today they are not. But as weather becomes more of a component of the business case, which we're seeing, you know, more and more, uh, and I think that we'll continue to see that more and more, um, maybe they'll start setting up, you know, teams uh, and, you know, you can be a meteorologist and work in, I don't know, an energy company or in, uh, or even a big tech company for all you know, right? Like they have hundreds of data centers around the world and, you know, they need to kind of see how the energy forecast is going to be for them to be, you know, hundred percent renewable, right? Like they need to know if that is a capability that they're going to have. So all of these companies are going to start, um, you know, hiring uh, weather forks, which of course they haven't in the past. Uh, and I see that for a company, you need to be vertically integrated today. But going forward, as a lot of these companies look towards setting up their own weather teams and, you know, for, for insurance, it's almost a competitive advantage, right? Like if you have access to proprietary data and you, you have access to data that can help develop a model, um, a parametric insurance model that can help you, you know, you send an alert to your customers saying that there's something coming, it's almost a competitive advantage. So, you know, they're more likely to be investing in setting up these teams. So companies don't have to do the whole thing that they did before. But, you know, the it can go either way. Uh, let's see let's see how the industry evolves. I, I would agree with that. Uh, and I think the way you look at how it's set up right now, 
um, it's kind of that hybrid model, right? I mean, you've mm-hmm. got some companies who are who have their own little meteorological teams or they're hiring one-offs here and there. I think you're right. I think you're going to see more of that. I think you're also going to see more of the vertically integrated model. I think you need both. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for for a weather business, you know, to thrive and survive, I mean, Jeff and I have kind of had this hypothesis and I think that's what tomorrow and others are working from that. Hey, listen, like for me, for me to own this space, I need that. I need to own the vertical because mm-hmm. what I can do then is I can have my own sensing network, whether that's, you know, some sort of surface observation network They maybe they, they have their own little surface observation sensors mm-hmm. or it's a satellite observation uh, network like tomorrow's developing and, you know, a couple other companies. Or maybe it's, you know, sensing, lightning sensing, um, you know, Vaisala is an interesting uh, use case there. But sure. there's still a ton of gaps, right? Um, you know, we had, uh, it's a couple of things that we talked about on previous shows, like weather is literally a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar, if not uh, hundreds of billion dollar industry here, um, you know, aggregated over several years. And you know, we had a we had a guest on previously. We worked for in an energy company, and he's brought on specifically for his wildfire experience, right? Mm-hmm. But they're not tapping him, and they don't. I don't think they have other meteorologists on staff to get after. You know, well, how how is this gonna how is this gonna work in the renewable? Um, you know, so they're not asking him to get after some of those other challenging. Sure. And I'm like. How much money could you save, but you know, it, by knowing that a thunderstorm is going to be over a location and, and is going to wipe out your your heat load capacity, so that you don't need to go and buy energy um, or your your cooling load capacity. That is. So I think I I, I have to think that you're going to see you know a hybrid system can continue to to evolve and 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 go forward. But I think you know companies, I get the sense that companies are seeing a little bit of the writing on the wall, whether it's a direct weather impact to their business operations, or, um, you know, if you're an insurance company, whatever the case is, like, how do you optimize it? And that's, that's the thing that a lot of these, you know, um, I think humans have a, have a a really, really hard time understanding risk. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, hiring a meteorologist or someone that's familiar with earth observation data or whatever the case is, uh, to how much, how much little investment you need up front, you know, with that risk management, that weather risk management to, um, to pay down the road is, 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 is incredible. And I really, you know, I really appreciate how you put together this, you know, you call it your weather operating stack. Um, I, I'm curious, um, and you, you talk in your your um, your blog post on this. You break things down into the public sector and the private sector. Um, you know, and Jeff kind of alluded to the different layers, right? You got your observations, your models, the products, and then the insights kind of baked into that. Um, where do you see that interaction between what historically, like Jeff talked about, the government's been involved with? the private sector in that public private partnership, where do you see that evolving? Yeah, it's an interesting question because, you know, obviously I've wondered about that quite a lot because there are not many industries like that. As, uh, as Shimon from tomorrow would say, there are not a lot of industries uh, that, and, and I was also very surprised to see status quo. And that's also why transitioning that is going to be pretty hard unless it happens in a very gradual way, it's not going to be radical because, you know, weather is a public good, right? Like it cannot be transferred to a commercial company in, in a way. And, you know, I, I linked, a, I linked um, I guess, an article in the, in the video of, uh, you know, of a company kind of, you know, commercializing it in a way that is probably not, I don't know, moral, I suppose. So, you know, we probably don't want that world where you have one city, one country, or even, you know, one company knowing something in advance and, you know, saving their assets versus another company not knowing. And I don't think we're going to get to that world, but I I fear that that can happen in a developing country where, you know, you're almost starting uh, from not very efficient weather infrastructure. And if it's completely um, private, you probably can expect that, right? Like some developing countries that have, you know, partnerships with one country can just get that 
uh, partnership going. But then thankfully, you know, we have the WMO and, you know, we have the global consensus on, you know, data sharing uh, around the world. Uh, so, you know, I don't think we're going to get there. But then from, a, from an interaction standpoint, um, I think it will happen, but I think it depends on the willingness to cooperate and the willing and also from that's on the private side, public sector side, but on the private sector side, the ability to prove what they're saying, right? Like the, the it, it, it's interesting because, you know, obviously we have lived up to a standard or a quality of data from all the public sector missions that are currently flowing in orbit. Can all the private sector missions tick all the boxes? I think not because, you know, there's a certain level of compromise because, you know, they don't have a billion dollar uh, budget for each satellite. Uh, so, you know, they need to take com- some compromises, whether it's, you know, whether it's starting from what kind of redundancy mechanisms are available on the satellites to how the data is downlinked and the quality of the data uh, as well. So it's, I think, a combination of both, um, you know, from the public sector, like I said, the, the willingness to cooperate and seeing, you know, where they can fill the gaps. And I think the conversations have started slowly. And of course, in the US, you know, Noah has been, let's say, buying some data from commercial data companies uh, through the commercial data program. Uh, and in Europe as well, UMSAT has started buying data from Spire. And I think it's it's probably going to, I don't know if it's if it's a case of where developing countries will kind of leapfrog and start buying capacity once, you know, satellite data becomes available on a regular basis, uh, let's say even tomorrow and Geoptics and all the private, private sector guys that I put on the list launch their satellites. Because um, there's also the ground sector, sorry, the ground infrastructure uh, aspect where it's it's a function of you know, them getting a grant from a World Bank or some sort of, a, you know, an IFI, International Financial Institution, that helps them set up that infrastructure. But the, the sustainability of those is, is, has come into question quite a lot of times, right? Like they get a three-year grant funding for setting up weather stations or radars in their country. And then three years later, you know, the you know, incrementally stop working and then, you know, the, it doesn't exist anymore. So either the World Bank funding needs to continue or... Uh, are the companies where their infrastructure doesn't exist anymore. So it's not a very sustainable solution. So satellites can help, you know, fill the gap in some way. But, you know, obviously you can't do that without the ground infrastructure. So I guess we need to find a working model to to make that evolve. And that's why I appreciated what Tomorrow was trying to do with their nonprofit. And, you know, they're working with the Gates Foundation to kind of set up early warning systems um, in some parts of Af- Africa that they just announced uh, during COP. Um, so I guess the the... The, the money where the money is coming from is is going to be very important from a global perspective, of course, because from a global perspective, especially in developing countries, we need to find a way because there are there is data going to be available, but unfortunately, that data is not going to be available for free because it's from the private sector, and they need to be compensated. Uh, you know, you can't expect them to give away money; it's not charity, and but the weather is also a public good, right? That's why I would. I want more people to think about this problem because it's it is going to get worse and worse. Uh, I would say in the next few years, uh, as we see more and more impacts of um, impacts of extreme weather events around the world, um, and I don't know if it has gotten as much attention. Um, and I think the UN announced the the early warning for all initiatives for next five years. Everyone, every, next five years, everyone will get early warnings. Great, but how are we going to implement that? What is the role of the private sector? I don't think we have seen all of that. I think it's still a very public sector focused initiative. Um, hopefully it evolves because you know in the next five years there's going to be more satellites from commercial uh, satellite companies to on the both on the observation front but also on the modeling side, right? So on the modeling side as well, there are initiatives in, in the companies that are that are being formed around the world, whether it's for seasonal forecasts or for forecasting. And how are they going to work together? So it's not just a case of observations, but also in the modeling side. And I think NOAA has, again, kind of started some initiatives and collaborations with the with the private sector, which is great to see. Uh, but then how is that going to operationalize? Because all of these are, I feel like they're all like phase zero projects. But then, you know, we haven't figured out how it's going to work in, in real time. Or are our countries and cities going to be left to, you know, deal with it themselves? Because, you know, after... After the New York um, floods was the last year, they you know they started looking at uh, you know firming up their 
let's say their infrastructure and their tools for 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 the weather, weather monitoring and i think they uh, i think there was there was also a podcast on npr if i'm not mistaken where you know the someone from there was talking about how you know they want to use all the available technology you know whether it's using option number one that's from the national weather service and option number two from a private weather company from a consumption standpoint, they want to have almost like, you know, a doctor's opinion, you know, a backup and then, sorry, an opinion, opinion number one and then a backup opinion to to decide, you know, how to respond to, to events. So is that going to be on the consumer side, how the public sector, private sector cooperation is going to happen? You know, that's also an interesting standpoint. So, yeah, it's a, a lot to explore. And I don't know if we have enough talking and discussions happening in that front. It's really fascinating to think about uh, the the psychology. I, I I like thinking about psychology, the psychology of risk, mm -hmm. um, and the psychology of communicating and understanding how that risk is communicated. Um, you know, whether you know, how how do people get it? You know, their information is it through the news? Is it you know the old school news? Is it is it through you know most of it's it's through an app these days? I think globally, um, and but I think we in I and I say we as we in uh, the developed world take for granted where we, how far we've come in terms mm -hmm. of that risk communication. And so, uh, uh, for instance, you know, like Hurricane Ian, I mean, we, Florida had, um, I think the most deaths in a, in a hurricane in, in, in several decades with mm -hmm. Hurricane Ian here recently. Yeah. And part of that, part of that, I think was a breakdown in, in, uh, risk communication and risk understanding by the people, you know, who, who, who unfortunately, who, who perished. And, and part of that was also like, hey, the hurricane track shifted and this and that, and how do you communicate that? But just literally, you know, 10, 12 years ago, maybe a little bit more, um, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to get the name of the storm right, the tropical cyclone that just came across, uh, I think it was Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Uh, back in 2008, 2010 time frame, I mean, killed 100,000 to 300,000 people. Yep. I can't remember. It was a lot of people. I mean, like in the six digits. And we in the developed world take that for granted, how far we've come. I mean, the most that we've ever had killed in a, in a hurricane in the U.S. is six to 8,000. And that was the, or six to 10,000. That was the Galveston hurricane of, of 1900 and of course you didn't have satellites back then you didn't have you barely had a national weather service and that's where this early warning for all i think you know effort really initiative uh, really matters for especially for for developing countries because like you said they don't have the infrastructure to launch their own satellites some ha barely have the infrastructure to have a meteorological service uh, alone as in, in, in its in itself but I think the the parallel is very interesting that you kind of talk about in in your in your blog is that you know overseas with developing countries it's you know what does this country have versus this country have or not have in in the United States that parallel is you know from a city perspective mm -hmm. and we hit it on this in a previous show of ours is like well if in a crisis situation let's say that Hurricane Ida comes up you know the east you know, the East Coast and floods out like it did last year. Well, if City A in New Jersey is using um, a forecast from one commercial company, but City B right next to it is using a different forecast. Um, and and if you have these competing, in a, in a, especially in a crisis, mm -hmm. it seems like a recipe for, for disaster, no pun intended, you know, just in terms of the risk communications and, and how do you communicate that? So, I mean, like, I think that's going to be that for me, the data, when you talk about earth observation technology, the data and the volume of data is probably one of the dealing with that and the breadth of, of a data that's available, whether it's spectral or temporal, all these different resolutions is, is one of the first challenges. But the biggest challenge is, it, for me, for all of this, whether it's earth observation or anything is. How do people understand it and make decisions with it? Mm -hmm. And that's where it comes down to the insights. And that's where I think any company is going to continue to make, um, you know, good revenue is, is, is boiling that down. Yeah, I know hundred percent. It's also a question of how the end users demands are going to evolve. Uh, and, you know, we are, we are used to using, and I think what I want to kind of talk about and write about more is 
the end users of weather are, of course, it's going to be the general public, but then the commercial case for weather is only going to increase. And if you're a company who's setting up a, a new solar farm, you cannot not think about integrating, you know, hyper local, high resolution weather forecasts into your into your mechanism. I mean, of course, you take that for granted because you just assume so you probably won't think about it. But then you're thinking about it on a global level and on a global level, as we discussed, right, like the, the data is not or the forecast is not available on the same level. So if you're a company that is planning, uh, you know, has a global plan or, you know, wants to set up this in this part of the world and in another part of the world, you know, UAE or did I, I think in this year, UAE got like record floods. So, you know, if, if that country is planning towards installing renewable capacities, they were not ready for, uh, you know, rain, you know, thunderstorm and heavy shower forecasts because, you know, that part of the world is not used to getting that. But unfortunately, depending on what happens and how climate change evolves, they're going to have to set up infrastructure. So, you know, if you're an energy company or an insurance company, you will start thinking about weather uh, and using weather data and the consumption of the data from a combination of sources. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the psychology, like you said, uh, and whoever offers the best solution for, you know, the highest value for the lowest price will win. And if it's happening through a collaborative effort of, you know, they see one interface and that interface just gives the best forecast and people don't care if it's come from private or public, that's one way. Or they will be forced, like some cities, to have two kind of tools in front of them, one from the free service and one from the paid service and see which one's better. Hopefully the second world is not where we get to because that's going to be confusing. And like you said, cities are not going to do proper risk management because one tool is going to say something and another tool, which has different data sources, is going to say something else. So yeah, hopefully we get to a collaborative kind of single uh, solution, um, globally speaking. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. So, so here's my prediction. I went and got a couple of books that I wanted to, <laughs> to highlight. But um, so Ryan brought up that, you know, one of the key factors, almost a linchpin um, factor is the communication mm -hmm. and how people make decisions with risk. So I agree with that, that communication element. And actually it kind of came in as the thing I brought up, you know, with uh, the media stuff at the very beginning of our podcast. And and, you know, we focus on the trifecta, the triple point, you know, weather and climate, technology and society. Right. But I think it's because we're dealing with complex information, complex data, complex systems. Right. To properly deliver value in that there has to be high. There has to be the right type of teaming. Uh -huh. And so the two books that I've, I've thought of immediately uh, when we're discussing this. And this is not these t these books are not related specifically to our topic area, huh. but they are to technology. And so team topologies and it's organizing business and technology teams for fast flow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this data mesh concept, which has to do with um, sort of a counter uh, to the traditional data lake, data warehouse, data pipeline concepts. And wh where this is going is that the root of both of these books, the at, at the foundation is the human cognitive load. So like what worked for a couple decades in the United States, at least in, in Europe, they had slightly different variations, but was this government developed technology and this sort of partnership with media and local governments. Right. And so there's a, it's complex, but it's, there's a, there's a set of standards and governance for communication. Now technology is coming along and some economics are changing such that it's disrupting this, right? But what I'm thinking is, is that the most successful companies to disrupt this space will be able to organize their technology well, you know, so mm -hmm. even though they have to stack a vertical to the, the weather operating stack, as you say, they're going to have to have good teaming in the various, you know, components of that stack, right? Like you can't, you know, they said it on the, the tomorrow.io interview with uh, how I built this, you know, that they're not trying to um, do everything in space. They just want to do the thing that they think they're good at, you know. Sure. Um, and and so um, anyway, so I think and then with the data mesh book that I was referencing, 
Um, what was kind of interesting about that is that with the data, the, the old approach of dump all your data in a lake, in a data lake and get it curated into a warehouse and then, hey, data user, data scientist or end user, you figure it all out. You worry about the quality. The, the thesis of this book is, no, let's have a, um, a basically a, a product team or a, um, a domain focused team that delivers data from the very beginning all the way to a quality controlled data product. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I, so where, where I'm kind of combining this is, is I think that these two things brought together in the form of a commercial entity can deliver this. But I, I think that somebody doing all of that new uh, type of stuff well is probably the, you know, I guess my hypothesis is that those will be the successful companies. The ones that try to bite off too much, too much cognitive load, um, the lack, the proper teaming, because, you know, a, a complex system of systems requires a team of teams, not just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one, one entity. So, anyway, I just thought that was, you know, as we were talking through this, uh, something that it, it's sort of the combination of, you know, the current way technology is going and the way people are teaming. I think we're, we're going to see something with this. I don't know what yet though. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it, it's impossible to do that because, you know, today's world, we won't get here, uh, you know, if, if not for the collaboration that we have from different countries and around the world of different standards, whether it's for data sharing or it's for communicating and they all came together to kind of agree on, you know, one thing that can apply globally. And of course, each of them will have their own local take because, you know, you need to have a local adaptation towards how people are going to consume that information. And that's where the role of the media companies and the private sector comes in because you need to consume in a way or communicate in a way that people are willing to consume. Or like the, the, the companies that are working out in the US, if they take and apply that and they say market expansion, I'm going to go to Nigeria and I'm going to communicate the same way, probably not going to work. You know, they can use the same emojis and that's that's probably global but then the way you communicate and how often you communicate and the way you communicate is probably going to be very different so i guess that's that's where we cannot set global standard because that's where we need to kind of localize um, in a way so that that teaming up will inevitably happen because if, if a company tries to do everything they'll soon figure out that they cannot because yeah they they either have to be in every part of the world and in every region of the world uh, and localize, which one company cannot do. So I think it's inevitable. So Jeff made a prediction there. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, Arvind. What's your bold prediction for the earth observation space? Where do you think it's going to be in 2030? Uh, I guess satellite data is already kind of integrated into people's lives in the background, but I think it's going to be more in the foreground that, they're going to know why they're doing it and why they're consuming it. And they're going to have um, a strategy behind why they are doing it. It's not just a question of, I'm going to integrate this data because it's available. They are doing it for a reason. And each of them will do it in different ways, right? Like if you're if you're a country, you would have your Earth observation strategy aligned towards a specific need. And of course, that that can mean a defense and intelligence need. But, but then it can also mean my country is very, very prone to floods. So we need, you know, a way of earth observation that is very localized towards us. And it also applies to the commercial sector. So if you're uh, an energy company, you might want to even have your own vertically integrated infrastructure, right? Like I want to own my own weather stations and radars and perhaps, you know, lease some satellites out because that data is so important to me that I'm going to have my own strategy towards it. So, uh, so it's, it's almost like it's going to be bespoke, localized and custom earth observation solution for everybody, but it, it's going to be independent of whether it's from space or whether it's from, you know, ground and how they're going to implement it is of course going to differ. But then I think each of us, each of the companies in different industries, especially the large ones that are very dependent on weather, will have their own strategy and and that would include things that we talked about, you know, them having their own 
small meteorological teams because you know they consider it a competitive advantage to have that um, over their competitor who will probably not have have that access to that data because until this point it's been very democratized and open and everybody can use it but as technology helps us get hyper local high resolution and global which was not a thing before right like some companies would want to take advantage of that so they would have their own strategy it's not going to be Everybody uses the same forecast that was, you know, given to them by the National Weather Service or the local meteorological agency. They would try to kind of add their own, uh, you know, need, uh, sorry, their own um, take on it, whether it's from their own data sources or them investing in new stations that can then provide that, you know, uh, advantage for them. So, yeah, so that's just one thing that I can think of at this point. But, I mean, another thing that is more, I guess, um, hopeful is more, the early warnings for all or some variation of early warning for all would be a reality because I think we will have a lot of reactive initiatives from different parts of the world that is going to improve forecasting around the world because I've seen that firsthand in France, um, a small island in France called Corsica and they got a huge uh, like like flash flooding this summer and it took everybody by surprise and people started to question like, why were we not warned? You know, we are in France. This is a developed country, which probably I think has one of the highest local weather stations in the world. Why did we have that? So, and it, it, it went to the government, right? Like, why did it happen? It's, it's crazy. Why did it happen in France? You know, we're not, I mean, it didn't lead to a lot of casualties, but then it just took everybody by surprise, including the meteorological agency. So, you know, th that's going to happen more and more as a function of, you know, the world we are living in. And that's going to lead to more investments and focus as well in across the value chain, right? Like, you know, the assessment would say maybe there's a gap in observation or, you know, maybe there is a new type of data that we haven't consumed yet or our communication ways are very outdated. We need to change that, right? So it's going to become more, it's going to come more in the forefront um, just as a function of times you're living in. And I think it's going to happen top down because you know, it's going to almost become, you know, it's already become kind of a political thing. But then as climate change kind of wrecks a lot more havoc, people are going to demand answers. And I think there's going to be more top down focus on Earth observation. Again, I'm not saying just from a security standpoint, which I think is a function of this year's, you know, global events is, is already happening. But then from a weather perspective as well, it's going to happen. Um, and I think we're already seeing that. I mean, I saw that Chile has a Minister of um, Climate and Environment and, you know, cities are appointing chief heat officers, I suppose. And, and I think uh, Greece has one, if I'm not mistaken. I think, of course, in the U.S. as well, you know, you see, you know, NOAA investing more and more into climate resilience and um, climate information and services. Uh, you know, I think a few billions were invested this year. And, you know, it's, it's not going to be called Earth Observation, but then Earth Observation is going to be part of that, right? Like the, the Infrastructure has uh, Act does not have anything that has to do with Earth Observation, but then Earth Observation is going to power a lot of the climate resilience that is going to happen. You know, new renewables being invested. How are, you know, how are they going to predict the hydropower uh, that is going to be generated? You know, things like that, or for pipeline monitoring, uh, whether in the oil and gas sector. So it's going to be a lot also happening top down as well. Yeah, I think the the communication space is is you know ripe for future future focus. And and I you know I don't I don't like seeing weather and climate disasters around around the world. Um, they are focusing events though for that investment on how, how do we how do we prepare for these? How do we adapt to them as you know these things happen? Right now, we we still continue to be more in that reactive space rather than that preparedness kind of space. Um, and I guess the the last point that that I'll make, um, and just from a you know my prediction, if you will, we've I think the 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 last ten years or so, you know, we've been kind of tinkering around the edge of, of, you know, new technologies, whether that's use of SAR, synthetic aperture radar, uh, volume, increasing the volume of data, which is, you know, volume of data is, is important, but you got to have quality data. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be interested to see use of different orbits, to be honest. Um, you know, we have polar orbiting satellites out there that provide, you know, very high resolution, but smaller span, uh, breadth of, uh, uh, a band, uh, whereas, you know, 
geostationary. There, you know, there's really no geostationary commercial satellites that I'm aware of out there um, that are doing that. So maybe the the commercial space gets more into the geostationary. But the orbit that I feel like is perhaps the most underrated is the highly elliptical orbits. We don't have a lot of sensing besides polar orbiting uh, over the polar regions, and we don't have a lot of sensing, uh, no. you know, ground sensing network out there either. So. I, I've got this theory that, you know, in, within the next 10 years that we might see more high, highly elliptical or geo orbiting satellites providing data, especially as the Arctic opens up more, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you get sea lanes opening up and, and that sort of thing. Um, we need data up there um, and that data gets fed into the models. And if you have better characterization of things like sea ice and the atmosphere up in the polar regions, that transfer of energy from poles to the equator, that inter interface between the two, I think is going to become really important. Yeah. No, I think one thing to add from a Earth observation or let's say a space industry standpoint is I'm really curious to see what the impact of two technologies is going to have in, in, the, in the weather world. One is on orbit processing. I don't know the level of impact this technology is going to have, um, especially given the complexity of like the calibration and uh, the pre-processing that we need to do. So, is there can there be you know anything done on that level? Because you know the downlinking some level or some pre-processed data is already going to be better, and it's going to solve you know even if it saves a couple of minutes, it's already you know big uh, in you know in this world. And this. Uh... Arvind, that's a really interesting thing you brought up. So I, I'm my day job. I do more computing type stuff, but sure. So what? Uh, so the onboard on uh, processing. Can you expand on like what's happening? Like, what are we talking about? What level of compute are we dealing with? It's it's, it's in a very early TRL. Like it's in a two, three, four uh, right now. You know, it's not in a seven, eight, nine. So I think a lot of things are still being figured out, and I think there are a lot of open questions in terms of. Uh, you know, where the storage is going to happen. Are we going to have, you know, are we going to have enough storage capacity in, in space? And I think there are com some companies working on that. Can the storage capacity inside a satellite be enough? Um, yeah. You know, depending on the type of data, it's going to be very complex to even even talk about because some data hyperspectral is just very, very heavy. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, so just from a basic storage standpoint, we need solutions, you know, forget, you know, what the level of data is, can we calibrate it, but can we store it? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting concept because I think of all the space things you have to consider, like cooling and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have, you have more, possibly more solar energy or easier to get to, you know, and stuff. Um, but uh, it's certainly uh, an interesting thing, but I interrupted you. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. So you talked about onboard processing. What? Uh, what? Oh yeah. Uh, there was a, what was the second? The second was um, inter satellite links. So for for communication to reduce the latency, right? Like so, if you have satellites now, it's it's almost very much dependent on you know ground stations and when the passover happens, uh, especially for low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, as we get more inter satellite links, can we have you know a smaller way to reduce latency where? You know, you have another satellite that's just going to have a pass over the ground station. So you have an inter-satellite link. And, you know, again, a lot of open questions. Do we have a global standard or, you know, can company A only collaborate with company B and send their data down? Um, so those are questions to be, you know, thought about. But, you know, in the context of weather, I think it, the latency of, of the data as we have more commercial satellites up there becomes interesting because for, for the public sector missions, I think, you know, the infrastructure and the ground stations are laid out. And they have plans to, you know, improve it, upgrade it over a period of time. But then as commercial satellites launch, especially, you know, once focusing on different sensors, whether it's in, you know, precipitation radars from tomorrow or as fire gets into sounders, um, as, they are, as they are thinking about, you know, all those downlink um, latency questions, um, it, it's just going to become interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to see from a technological standpoint how these two technologies have, have an impact from a, from a space point of view. Well, Arvind, this has been really a fascinating discussion. I, I'm glad that we were able to finally get this uh, For sure, yeah. get this done. Great. I mean, we had a couple of hurricanes and some COVID kind of get in the way of our of our plans, but uh, it's been great to sit down with you today. Um, and you know, on this show, um, again, we saw this as a collaborative kind of. Uh, episode so for our, for our listeners go out there and listen to terra watch space uh and subscribe to arvin's newsletter very insightful 
information out there. Arvin, it's been uh, great to have you on the show today. Hey, thank you, Ryan. This was, it was great. I mean, an hour of speaking about weather and kind of, you know, opening up my mind to new questions and new thoughts. It's, it's been great. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, checking out the upcoming episodes. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's Triple Point Podcast. If you liked it, subscribe to our newsletter at triplepointpodcast.com. Give us a shout and a five-star rating on your favorite podcast station and tell your friends about it. Or you can email us at triplepointpodcast at the number 81degrees.com. Jeff and I wish you a happy holiday season. Join us for more fun and insightful episodes on the Triple Point in 2023. Until then, so long.